and welcome to Keep the Bastards on Us, the podcast of the Australian Democrats. I'm your host, Alana Mitchell, and on this episode, we talk to the CEO of Women for Election Australia. Women for Election is an organisation whose mission is to inspire, equip and sustain women to successfully stand for and thrive in public office in Australia. Lysia Heath is the inaugural CEO of, of Women for Election, and she's dedicated to inspiring and equipping more women across the country to run for public office at the local, state or federal level. Lysia ran in the 2018 Wentworth by-election, triggered by Malcolm Turnbull's resignation, and helped shape the national political debate with the eventual winner of the by-election, Karen Phelps, adopting a number of the policy positions Lysia ran on. In addition to training women to run for office, this year is also focused on engaging more women in Australia's political process and educating them on the various roles they might like to take to help another woman get elected. Women for Election has gone from strength to strength over the last few years, recently winning a $5 million grant from the federal government to expand their programs to train thousands of women to run for office and create a campaign in your pocket app to assist candidates. As you'll hear in the episode, Lysia is very excited to be delivering an incredible free resource to prospective candidates and their supporters to help them with their campaigns. It's also my enormous privilege to be able to tell you that not only is Campaign in Your Pocket about to be released, but that Women for Election will likely be running a face-to-face training workshop near you in the months ahead as they expand their training programs. My co-host Steve Fatey was super keen to have a chat with Lysia about Women for Election and their work, but he felt that if we were talking about female representation in parliaments, then we should have women leading that conversation. So he asked our Democrats colleague and friend of the pod, Leonie Green, to join us instead. Leonie and I are both alumni of Women for Election, and we're incredibly grateful to Alicia and her team for the training and support we received from the organisation. But enough from me. Let's hear from Alicia. Alicia, Leonie and I pay our respects to the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we recorded this interview and their elders past and present. Sovereignty never ceded. So, Lucia, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. We're so excited to have you. I was oh, my just, pleasure. Just for our listeners who may not be aware of your background and, and how Women for Election came to be, do you want to take us through your experiences in the Wentworth by-election and sort of what triggered this incredible movement that you're, build, you're building? Well, it's interesting. I had a long-term career in financial services and I took a sabbatical year because I I knew I wanted to do something different. I knew it had something to do with improving Australia's political landscape without knowing exactly what that job was. And in that sabbatical, I came across an organisation called Women for Election, and I was actually an attendee at their first ever training conference. It was in New South Wales Parliament House. So I was a punter in the stands. Uh, (laughs) It obviously fizzed me up considerably because a few months later, I was on their board. Remember, I wasn't working at, at the time and I became intimately involved in helping them write their business strategy, uh, reaching out to politicians to come and speak at different events, running training events, all, all that kind of stuff. So, and I, you know, I guess I was doing it because I had an aspiration to run one day, but that was far into the future. But there were, there were a couple of things that I just kept hearing time and time again in those events. And one was, you'll never feel ready, <laughs> but step forward anyway. And the other thing was timing is everything. So if something unexpected happens in your electorate, uh, then your ability to influence change is massively amplified. And lo and behold, in my electorate, in a matter of months later, my local member, who was the Prime Minister at the time, stepped down. And you just couldn't read about it because it was not my intent to step forward in that by-election in Wentworth when Malcolm Turnbull stepped down. But because I'd heard uh, those earworms were in, 
my six-year plan suddenly compressed to six weeks. Oh, gosh. And I, I found myself running, and I guarantee I wasn't ready. I was not ready. Um, <laughs> but I changed the outcome of the election just by running, and that, that has led me to, to what I'm doing now. That's brilliant. So what are you doing now? <laughs> uh, so now I'm CEO of Women for Elections. So the organisation where I was a board member before, we had zero. There was, wasn't even a P&L. There was no P. <laughs> there was no profit. <laughs> we, you, know, we, you know, we were run by very well-intentioned volunteer board. And after I had the experience I did running, when I did step down off the board and I had scores of women approach me through my own campaign saying, look, you look, you sound just like me and I'm rooting for you and I would like to buy you a coffee at the end of this because I think I'd like to do the same thing one day but I have no idea how to get started. And it was that, it was me just ruminating about that and the fact that I hadn't got elected, but I still considered that I'd won because I influenced the outcome. And also that everyone told me that it would be horrifically toxic, the experience, but it wasn't. It was one of the most positive experiences of my life. And that that kind of triangulation of those three things made me go back to the Women for Election board and say, look, I'd like to be the inaugural CEO. I'm going to take this organisation from down here to up here because I think I think there really is a need and I think women in Australia are interested in politics and I think we can help fill a vacuum of information that's going to ultimately benefit Australia's political landscape. So that's what I'm doing now. Fantastic. And in the interest of transparency, I should let everybody know that both Leonie and I uh, are alumni of uh, Women for Election Australia. We've done your Equip Masterclass and a number of the smaller sort of masterclasses that you guys hold on specific topics like uh, preferences and social media and, and me- you know, ordinary media and other things. So we're deeply invested in your <laughs> journey and, and, and the organisation. So, we, you know, this is not going to be a hard-hitting journalistic interview. But... We are super, super grateful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that you did and and made that decision, Lucia, and and set up the organisation in the way that you have, because we've absolutely been the beneficiaries of what you set out to do. It feels so good. It feels so good to hear that because um, you're invested in our journey and we're invested in your political journey as well. Like it, it's it's a two way street. So and who benefits better? Australian society. Absolutely. So it's just yeah. You're some of our fabulous alumni, but we've got nearly 3,000 of them across the country now. Wow. And you've, from you've so had so many different equations as well. Sorry, I've I'm, I'm no, no. just jumped in a lot. But I, Go for it. I think one of the things that really stood out to me that I loved as well was um, the diversity of people in the room in your programs. I, I just was, I had no idea what to expect. And I was in the throes at the time of, oh, my goodness, what am I supposed to do as a candidate? I uh, (laughs) need to learn some things pretty quickly. And I showed up and felt like I was in a room of peers. I was in a room of people who had similarly stepped up and it was a particularly interesting election for that, I think, phenomena perhaps, but hopefully it's going to continue that way. Um, But people who had stepped up, that absolutely also didn't feel like they knew what they were doing or or had uh, a first idea what to do next. But we were able to navigate through that and have your program navigate, help us navigate through that. Mm. But it was, yeah, the diversity in the room I loved. It was just, it was wonderful. Different political persuasions, different reasons why people were running, different levels of government that people were interested in as well. Yeah, it was incredible. Oh. Oh, well, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think it is truly one of the magic ingredients of the programs that we run. I mean, obviously, there's content within our programs, but one of the pieces of feedback that I get time and time again is I felt kind of alone. I've been agitated, yelling at the TV by myself. 
Uh, and then, you know, I was I was in a room with 20, 30, 40 other women of different political persuasions, but they were all agitated for the same reason. And there's camaraderie in that, <laughs> massive camaraderie, and actually an extraordinary support network for our alumni as well. So, you know, we have people in the room who say, okay, I'm not I'm not ready to run or I haven't even made the decision that I'm going to run yet, but I can tell that you're going to run and I would really like to help support you, whether mm. that might be help to do your social media or maybe it's help to hand out on the day how to vote cards or things like that. But I think the engagement piece is the critical piece, engaging in Australia's democracy. And that looks different for different people, depending on where you are in your life cycle. But just in increasing active citizenry, that's the antidote, I think. So I'm so glad that you felt that way in your session. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the thing that's I found fascinating, because uh, I was a little bit earlier, I think, in my journey than Leonie was. We, we nominated Leonie as a candidate, and then I think she went into full panic and, and, and signed up with you guys probably the next day to, to start preparing herself. But I had done your Equip course, I think, a few months earlier. <laughs> Um, not not because I I had a, at that stage had assumed I was a candidate or, or was planning on being one, but because I thought well, I knew that we we were going to contest the election, and I thought I better go do some research and work out how to support our candidates, and I eventually ended up becoming one myself. But the thing I found fascinating was the not just the diversity of people in terms of of what levels of government they wanted to run and when when or how or why they wanted to run, but also there were so many people in all of your courses who were there to support candidates who, you know, there's so many people from community independent organisations who are very far removed from being a candidate but are there running social media or fundraising or, you know, hurting all the volunteers and, and things. And they're coming along to just learn the tools of the trade and learn how to support their, you know, their candidate and how to, to build their, their movements, which was an unexpected benefit that I hadn't thought of going in. But so crucial. So crucial. Look, it's it's so opaque. How, how you would run for office is so opaque. And what we know is that women, more than men, need more visibility, more transparency before they step into something. So if mm -hmm. you keep it opaque, they'll just they just won't consider it. Our whole role at Women for Election is to make how you would run for office more transparent and then show all of the roles that can exist within that life cycle and how attendees could use their skill sets in different ways. Fundraising skill sets, logistic skill sets, digital skill sets, communication skill set. Not everybody who comes out of our courses wants to run and that is that's still success for us. Mm -hmm. Because, because what they are is making an informed decision as distinct from not even considering it in the first place. But 100% of those who come out the courses and say, okay, I don't want to run, 100% of those still say, but I want to help in another way. And now I understand how my unique skill set can help another woman get elected. And they just wouldn't be able to find out that information any other way. I can't think of another way. So it's that that's how we're that's the service we're providing one of the things that i observed and and you know having having been in, in several of your classes now is that little light bulb going on for people who have come along very very you know, and often very intent that they aren't going to run but they want to support and then realizing that the skills that they already have in their day job, in you know their their daily life, it might even be skill sets they've developed through their hobbies or their community programs, suddenly going, oh, I can use this stuff. These are transferable. Absolute mind blowing moment when they when it all just clicks for them, and they're like, oh, I don't need to go and do a degree in political science or whatever. You know, I can get cracking tomorrow, writing an email or talking to people or setting up a Facebook group or whatever. Yeah, and let me take that a step further. I think one of the one of the things that gets me out of bed in the morning, one of the most inspiring pieces of my work is because we survey those 
when every everyone who when they start and and when they finish as well. So it's those women who come at the start and go, I'm not running. I am here to help someone else run. And then they come out the end of it and they go, right, okay, no, I, I am going to run. It is me. <laughs> it's, it's kind of this, it is this odd cultural thing about that we're in Australia. We're very, um, we can be a bit provincial when it comes to how we discuss politics in our communities. And it's almost this giving permission. There's like a permission we need to give ourselves And that's hopefully the journey that happens with our courses where they go, actually, it is me. I do have that ambition to run. And that's why one of the things, one of the things is our mantra, which is the hardest part of your campaign will be admitting that you want to run. And the rest is really a to-do list that we can help you with. But making that admission and making it out to someone else is the hardest bit about a campaign. Makes me think of that classic thing about, you know, uh, women going for a new role will look at a position description and if they can't do all of the things that are listed, they won't go for it. And a man will look at a position description and go, I can do 30% of it. I'll go for that. And that always fascinates me because like what you have just described, Lucia, kind of is that again, right? That that we stand back because we think, who are we to do that? We can't do that. We don't have those skills. And I think one of the fabulous things about your programs are that you that you are highlighting to us, this is how you bring your strengths together. And absolutely, this is your to create your to do your to do list. I'm very good at to do list. Um, but create your to do list. Like, just get really clear on what's the action that you need to take. But drawing on the strengths that you have. Oh, you are. You are so right, Leonie, because I think even in the three years that I've been CEO, I've seen my role change. We Women for Elections role is not to train women. Our role is to re-ban- rebrand political power in Australia because time and time again, I travel across the country or I go into regional Australia and it's crystal clear to me that it is the women running those communities. They run every aspect of those communities. They are doing what a good political representative should be doing. And in just about every case, they're doing it pro bono. There's a great saying, the patriarchy can only exist on the free labour of women. Yes. So when we push into these regional areas and see these women that have been doing these roles for 15, 20 years for their community, and I say, you know, you should run, you should run. And the the instant balk of, oh, I can't do that. I don't have the skills to do that because they're looking over in that political chamber and they're looking at how people are behaving and they're saying, I can't do that. And what women for election are saying is, good, (laughs) we don't want more of that. We want more of you, people who are who are who are focused on community are led by wanting to do the good for community and the skills you have that you're doing for the community now are completely transferable to political office be it council state or federal so our mission is to help women already doing the job see themselves as future political leaders i, I really strongly believe that it's fantastic, and the, the, one of the things that when I when I first discovered you guys and 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 looked into just signing up to your equip course was the belief on your website that government is a tool to improve community as opposed to being an instrument of power, and I think that just resonates so strongly with every single person I've met through WFE in in you know every class I've taken. And we're seeing this groundswell of women over the last couple of years in politics, like, you know, standing up to serve their communities. And and it is it is very much from that sort of thing of, no, we're taking back our government and we're taking back its purpose. And we're, the goal is to transform it to be a, a tool to improve community. And it's been corrupted into this tool of power. Yeah. And I, I don't think we can be too Pollyanna-ish. Uh, you know, I think the there's always been an element of obviously – people bastardizing power uh, and and uh, being led by ego. I think a really unfortunate part about 
the modern busy life is that um, whereas 30 years ago people had a great, you know, I'd think about my parents or my grandparents and they they would attend local branch meetings of political parties and they had that that time and and just like any other member-based organisation, Scouts had a greater membership, the Squash Club had greater membership and so on and so forth. The advent of the modern busy life means that that has dissipated and for politics what has happened over the last qu- quarter of a century, 30 years, is that the the person like you, 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 just the everyday person that would go and do one, two-term tenure in politics, the normal people I call them, <laughs> they've been absent. Mm. They've been totally absent. So what you've been left with is the really strong career politicians who've always been there. And they'll always be there. Mm. But what they haven't been is tempered by the other people who've had a career in nursing or teaching or journalism who come in, do their civic duty, and then they leave because they've got something to leave to. So mm. I and I think I I feel really positive because I think that's that's changing the engagement, people realizing that democracy isn't a spectator sport. That's a bit of the shift and What's really important now is that we maintain that momentum. I just don't want any of your listeners to go. To, we all deserved a bit of a lie down after the federal election, but just just not exhale and go, oh, we're done. You know, we're there because we're pushing a ute up a hill at the moment with women for election and we're the, we're the wedge that you put under the wheel <laughs> so that it doesn't roll backwards. So... Um, there's a lot more work to done and we want your listeners to come to our future courses and see themselves as future political leaders. Yeah, it's so important. Just that that, that mind shift that we talked about earlier of suddenly realising that, yes, this is something I can do, that, yes, I can be a future political leader. And political leader does not necessarily mean becoming prime minister. It can literally mean just standing up and leading in your community. That's all you need to do. I think it's that it's that engagement with whoever is your local representative and getting around them and expecting better from them, that's the bit that I'm excited that I can see changing. But it's interesting too, Lucia, because I'm, I'm really glad that you used that example of the it's the busyness of life that has had an impact on who goes into politics and, and what a politician looks like. One of the things that I think uh, I, well, I can see that we are coming out the other side of but I think was a reality for a few decades there was this feeling of we'd got there Mm. we'd got there right like I will fully own as a 40 something year old that I kind of went through my early years thinking we'd got there very aware of my privilege to be able to have said that Um, Mm. but I absolutely was you know I I can do anything I was brought up by amazing parents who were very traditional parents mum was at home and dad worked but I was never for a second under an impression that I couldn't do anything that I wanted to do. So I I grew up with this sense of we've got there as feminists. There's nothing more that needs to be done. Yeah. And I feel like my generation then dropped the ball somewhat yeah. because of that sense that we had. And so we've had this period of time where actually we've gotten stuck in the busyness of life and doing everything that we want to do with our lives and missing the bit that actually ultimately plays the biggest part in how we live our lives in terms of the decisions that are made Mm. um, by governments and if we're not in those positions and not influencing what decisions are made then we get some pretty pretty crappy outcomes and it kind of had to get as crappy as it got almost I feel like for us to en masse be kind of stepping up in the way that we so many of us have because we we were we were, at, we were screaming at the TV. I was absolutely screaming at the TV, and it it had to get that bad in some ways. Sadly, it feels like for us to then come and, and again, it kind of feels like we're coming out the other side. But before you said that, Lucia, I was thinking, oh, it's just an evolution. Like we're just kind of our system is evolving, our political system is evolving. You know, there was a period of time where not everyone got to vote. There was then a period of time where men who were property owners got to vote. And then there was a period of time where women, if you're white, got to vote. Our system has continued to evolve. And in my Mm -hmm. mind, I've seen this latest change as 
just the next wave of evolution, which I do still believe that it is, but I feel like actually you're absolutely spot on that there was a period of time where it could have gone on a different trajectory in terms of its evolution, but it didn't. It actually started to devolve somewhat because people weren't stepping up. You don't have to look any further than our, uh, you know, US neighbour to really, really cherish um, some of the systems we have in Australia because the the US political system has has regressed considerably and and that is still on the decline so and we're so god we're so lucky in Australia in many ways and we have a lot of work to do in in others but we have a fabulous book called from secret ballot to democracy sausage uh, by Judith Brett and it talks about Australia being the envy of of the modern world in terms of how we set up our political system in the early 1900s. We had an independent AEC. We moved our elections from a weekday to to the to the Saturday. It was compulsory voting. The secret we, ballot. Mm. Yeah, we, we knew that the secret. I didn't know that the secret ballot was an Australian thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah exactly. Preferential voting, like. Just so many safeguards, and gee whiz, if there's any, if that's ever an under threat, then you'll see me hit the streets. But it's it's something to be extraordinarily proud of. The, the, the typical Aussie might not know about it; they love their democracy sausage and, and going to vote. But but there's structural issues that we have in this country still that make it harder to get elected as a as a woman, and then. Even beyond that, a, a woman of cultural diversity, uh, a woman f- uh, from the disabled communities, from queer communities, young women, Australian politicians are some of the oldest in the world. There are some significant missing cohorts uh, that are not sitting in our political chambers and Women for Election is absolutely focused on changing that. In fact, we have just secured a grant from the federal government so that we can particularly focus on crossing the country and really doing outreach in those communities to inspire and equip those women to see themselves as those future political leaders. And I can't wait to kick this off and it's going to kick off in in July. And I can't wait to come and visit you over in WA and you in Victoria. And then we, you know, we push into Broome and Northern Territory and Cape York and Torres Strait and down to Tassie. So it's just, it's a really exciting project to be involved with and one that has never occurred in Australia before. That's brilliant. I'm I'm so thrilled and so proud for you guys that, uh, you know, your work has led you to here and that you've got that investment and, and that mandate from the government to go spread the word and and empower nationwide and and I think people saw the 2022 election as this sort of watershed moment in Australian political history and I look back at it and go no that was just the beginning that was that was the you know the snowflake triggering the avalanche we haven't seen anything yet and I'm so eager to see what Women for Election can do in, in terms of sort of kicking off that revolution and, and bringing democracy to all and, and you know, empowering the next stage of our, our political leaders. I know you've got to run off in, in a few minutes, but if we have listeners who, who want to get involved, who want to take your courses or, you know, help volunteer with you, how do they get in touch and how do they, they how do they get involved? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a, an awesome website, which is how a lot of people learn about us and get in contact with us. We really encourage people to sign up to our newsletter because that's when they find out when we're going to be in an area near them. And the same with our, our social media as well. I think in particular, the phase that Women for Election, the work that we've been doing over the last three years is to some degree is going to be retained, but we're about to evolve that considerably and to to doing place-based training, to doing online training, but also to launch an educational technology platform called Campaign in Your Pocket. Ooh. And that is... Yeah, that's it's super exciting. And the idea is that that is highly accessible 
and I guess more low touch than coming and attending um, an event when we're in Broome, for example. But the idea being that you can register for that resource. It's an app that will sit on your phone. And if you're in Tasmania or if you're in the Northern Territory, then you can really easily and accessible, uh, accessibly understand, okay, I'm going to run. Oh, what's the preference system here again? Oh, what's the donation cap that happens at the local government level in New South Wales? So there'll be fun videos and some politics 101 resources and then our 14 equip modules that both of you attended that will be as an online resource as well. And it just allows us to build a nationwide community where we can also, you know, even do things like job boards. Like, you know, I'm I'm over here running in Perth. If anyone wants to help with my social media for my campaign, then I'm looking for someone for eight hours a week or this one's a paid role and just just again a resource that doesn't exist currently but that we have a stretch goal of having 20,000 women on that resource and we can track their political journey from being an active citizen to a more informed voter to volunteering on someone's campaign to running themselves and then it's a free resource. It will be a free resource. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. It's just for I love and we're it. working on it right now. I'm literally in an office at the moment with a tech team working out how it's how it's going to look. So I'm particularly <laughs> inspired about that piece at the moment because I know it's going to make such a difference. Rather than point of the rebranding political power, right? It's it's thinking about how people how people learn and interact and, and what they do now to find information or to get stuff done. So I love that element of it as well. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I can't wait to share it with you both. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, just like the empowerment and sort of the self-actualization aspect of it is just, you know, everyone's journey is going to be different and everyone's journey is going to take a different amount of time and success is going to be different for everyone. And so to have that little campaign in your pocket where you can start your journey on your terms just just incredible. You've blown my mind again, Lysia. Never, it never ceases to happen. I'm going to get some testimonials from both of you and put it at the front of campaign in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank Love you it. so much. I, I know you've got to run, but thank you again. I'm, I'm so excited for you and so excited to have been, you know, and, and as uh, Leonie said, so grateful to have, have been part of, of Women for Election as a student and, and to have benefited from the collective wisdom that uh, that we got from you guys. So, yeah, Leonie, do you want to say anything before we go? No, just another thank you. Thank you so much, Lucia. <laughs> and I no, I will say something. Sorry, but I'll be quick, I promise. Um, I think that I, I was thinking about before that one of the reasons why I rejoined the Democrats was because I had always seen really strong female leadership across the Democrats' history. It's what got me interested in politics in the first place was watching amazing women in parliament stand up for things that mattered. And I, what I'm really excited about for Women for Election is that I can see that it is right across the board, we can then see this change, whatever the political persuasion might be. And until we do that, until we have a right across the board women showing up for all parties and being part of the decision-making processes in parties or as independents, but as Mm -hmm. members who are really deeply embedded in their communities and listening and then feeding different experiences into that. We don't get there until we get to there, you know, and I I think the exciting, as I said earlier, the exciting thing was just to see that level of diversity within your programs and more power to you, really. (laughs) All the power to you, Alicia. I just, I love what you, what you are doing and thank you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. And, um, Let's rebrand power together and just, you know, the power that's always been there, which is feminine power doing good for communities, is the is the feminine power that we want in our political chambers. And then that that will influence policy change that makes it easier for the next cohort and then the next cohort. And then we're in a wonderful positive feedback loop that to be honest, 
I think we are at the start of, and that success begets future success as well. So I, it's not lost on me that all our amazing alumni have been like these little ambassadors for us running around the country and and I'm sure that would have helped us secure this grant as well. So so thank you to you and, and good luck to the Australian Democrats and keep sending your future candidates our way. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you again, Lucia. Awesome. Brilliant. Thanks, Hapes, Lucia. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you to Lucia for having a chat to us about the great work that Women for Election is doing. And thank you to Leone for joining us for this chat. If you want to know more about Women for Election and the courses they run, there's links to their website in the show notes. I've also included a link to an article from the West Australian about Women for Elections grant to expand their training, and it features some commentary from one of their alumni who shall remain nameless because it was me. If you want to support Women for Election, you can donate to them via their website or just spread the word. Tell the women in your life about them and encourage the women you know to sign up for a course. You don't have to want to run for office to benefit from this training. We need more women at the table where decisions are being made at all levels of government. The Australian Democrats have been committed to this from the moment the party was formed, and we've demonstrated this with our pioneering history of female leadership. As it says on the Women for Election website, if we want to achieve more inclusive policy outcomes, we need to take charge of who's in charge. Keep the Bastards Honest is brought to you by the Australian Democrats. This episode was edited and produced by me, Alana Mitchell. If you'd like to keep in touch, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Spoutable, and Threads by searching for Australian Democrats. And you can see what we stand for, what we value, and what our policy positions are at our website at democrats.org.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.